May the best brand win with Scott Robertson's Music Biz Marketing Strategies. Now, here's your host, Scott Robertson. Hey, happy Friday, everybody. You are tuned to May the Best Brand Win on Intertalk Media, the undisputed leader in music biz talk and marketing talk. And I am Scott, uh, your host and a man who uh, cannot wait for the next season of Cobra Kai on Netflix. Am I right? So good. And uh, I might actually have to get an actual paid Netflix password uh, and, and watch it at this time instead of just using uh, many other Netflix passwords that I have. Uh, and, and speaking of uh, money for nothing and chicks for free, uh, producer Paul, uh, man, he skipped work again another Friday and, uh, and, and he is producing the show from wherever the wind has taken him, wherever he is. So send up a flare if you're in trouble, Paul. We, we, we miss you on the show and and, uh, you know, wherever you are, uh, you know, before before the audience hears it, Paul's been involved, but we don't know. Was it from a prison cell somewhere? We don't know. That's what I'm saying. So who am I? What do I do? Why should you care? How should you reach me? That kind of thing. Uh, I'm Scott. I run a marketing and, and public relations agency in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, I am uh, I, I guide clients to better marketing as we always talk about uh, how to make marketing better. I'm a certified story brand guide. Uh, now, so I can create even better brand stories, website wireframes, sales copy, and PR for the clients. And of course, my new book, uh, Just Stop It, Your Survival Guide to Marketing Myths, Mistakes, and Misgivings, is now available on Kindle, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and find flea markets everywhere. So if you like the show, you'll love the book. Uh, my mom has a copy. Uh, she's giving me an honest review on Amazon. We'll have to see how that works out. But uh, Anyway, get the book. You'll love it. Uh, today, I'm uh, very excited to welcome to the show a uh, a coach, uh, not a coach like you're like you're used to, not like a co not like Sean McVay from my world champion Los Angeles Rams. I just like saying the words "world champion Los Angeles Rams." That just it just flat really just flows off the tongue so nicely. Uh, but I'm talking about a personal coach and a business coach, uh, uh, Coach Arno. Uh, he helps results-driven executives uh, create the relationship that they want uh, when their partner, uh, even when their partner is not open for couples counseling, using his uh, LBR method. And we're going to hear more about that. So coming at you from sunny and hopefully maskless Malibu, California, please welcome Coach Arno. Hey, Arno, how you doing? Hey, Scott, doing pretty well, absolutely maskless here, breathing the ocean breeze and uh, excited to be on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, it's it's great to have you. And, uh, you know, let's just dive right into it. So, you know, so first of all, what kind of relationship do most executives want? That is a very good question. And um, I'd say the relationship preferences of executives are probably as different as people are different in general. But there are, of course, some, some commonalities as executives generally have a demanding and time-consuming job, which, well, can easily lead to the, to the spouse and the family feeling neglected. And now it's about fulfilling their needs while not impairing the business. And that can get really tricky. Interesting, interesting. Well, um, can you describe your LBR method uh, for our non-psychologist audience out there? And think, you know, you're talking to marketers, you got some drummers and bass players out there. So, you know, small words and, and things like that. You know what I mean? I mean, know, know your audience. Know your audience, Arno. Here we go. Okay. And I think I can even help the banjo players get in tune with their partner again. So, um, <laughs> I know, so, right? <laughs> yeah. so my cousin's actually banjo player. It's really funny. Um, it's a three-step process, basically. And the first step is, is looking into the past to reveal those unreleased persistent negative emotions. Um, like, thing, like things that happened earlier in that very relationship, or even in past relationships, and, and down to childhood. And then we release those emotions with a, with a, with a deep kind of meditative hypnotic process. So they're really gone. And that concludes the, the part of the coaching that is really um, pertaining to the past because then it's about moving forward. Um, as soon as you get the question, does that really work actually? Because it sounds a little bit woo-woo. Um, well, it does, it does. It works with, with little hurtful or disrespectful things that, that still stick. 
but I've also worked with people with deep trauma from military experiences. Think your friends blowing up in front of you, really crazy yeah. things of sexual trauma. And it is really, really deep work that we that we do in this in this first step. And then the second step is about self communication. Um, you know, many people think when they find the right partner, uh, conflicts will end, right? Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Wright, there are no fights anymore. That's not true. They actually found um, that you have the same amount of conflicts in positive relationships and in not so positive relationships. It's just about how those people go about that conflict. And just to, just to rub that in a little bit, you can't even get rid of conflicts that you have with yourself. Every person has conflicts with themselves. Do you know what they're called? They called. Uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, our self arguments. You know. <laughs> yeah. What What are they called? Yeah, they're called decisions and mistakes you find that you've made. Every decision you make sure. and every every mistake you find is a conflict you have with yourself. And as you, and if you're alive, you can't get rid of those. And if you're alive with your partner, you can't get a, get rid of them either. So, and and how you deal with your own conflicts is is metaphorical and and tells you a lot about how you go about conflicts with, with the other person. So that is the, the second step. And that's the prerequisite for the final and third step. And that is really the communication with the other person. And going through those steps in that order, I went through it myself and I see, I see amazing results with my clients. Impossible to not that's have results. Well, that, that's very cool. Um, and so, it, you know, Obviously, in a relationships, you know, there's the saying, it takes two to tango. But you say you can tango with just one, one of the parties, with just one person. How do you do that? I, I love that metaphor, Scott. I love that because it works really so well. Because when your old dances are not satisfying anymore, it's time to, new, to, to learn new dances. And the first step to, to learn a new dance is to practice those steps alone to really get them to truly really have them down. And then the better you dance, the better both of you will dance. When you stop stepping on their feet, even you will even have a better experience yourself. So that metaphor for works, works perfectly, but let's take it home to relationships. Here's what it looks like. You are part of your partner's environment and your partner is part of your environment. And most of the things we do are responses to our environment. So the minute you change, the minute you change your partner's environment and they have to adapt, then there must be a response. And if they love you, if they're a good person and you grow in an empowered way, there must be a positive change. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I hear you. So I've been married for, um, for almost 30 years. I'm coming, I'm coming up on, um, on, on year 30 of the marriage and, um, you know, Thank you. And, and, you know, and, and people, and people always kind of say, well, you know, you met your soulmate early in life and that kind of thing. But I don't think that people understand that, that, um, you know, it, it's, it, it's never like it looks on Instagram. It's never like it looks on Facebook. I mean, you know, pe two people together in a relationship is messy. And I think that one of the secrets to our success is we expected it to be messy. <laughs> we didn't, we, we knew that we got married young and we knew that we didn't know anything. And, and we knew that, that there's a million ways that it could go south and did, and, and absolutely did. Um, you know, but I do, I do think that expectations play a little bit of a role in it. Um, I want you to comment on this. I heard, um, you know, scientists say neuroscientists. You both, you and I study neuroscience, and they said that um, the 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 neuroscience kind of chemical reaction of love dies off in about twenty four months here on Earth, right? So, uh, so you the the fair the you know experiences that you're you know ha having in your brain that you experience as love and everything that dies off in about 24 months and that's why the divorce rate hits around two years is what i've always heard and you have to find some way something to replace that chemical feeling with so that you don't trick yourself into believing well 
this relationship is over just because the chemical part of, of how it interferes with your brain and love is blind and blah, 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 and all that stuff mm -hmm. and all that stuff happens. So what's your commentary on that, on the, on the 20, on the 24 months and, and then what you need to do? What do you think about that? Um, there, there is definitely, it's definitely chemistry, right? All our, our feelings that we have, all our emotions that we have do have a chemical counterpart in, in our bodies, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, speak, cortisol and adrenaline is stress, is frustration, is anger, is sadness. Uh, serotonin wakes you up in the morning, is feeling alert. The more serotonin you have, the happier you feel. Melatonin makes you feel tired. Uh, endorphin, the runner's high. The dopamine, all those things correspond with emotions and, and love is, is oxytocin, for example, and, and, and other things. And yeah, there is an absolute correlation between the chemicals inside of our body and that feeling and, and making, saying love is certain chemicals is also very unromantic, of course. And it has another side to it. It, it, has, the, it has the chemical side. It, you, it is this, this feeling that you have, which is not very clear to define. You can also name it short and brief, unconditional appreciation. Unconditional appreciation oh. is love. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I like to use my dog as a metaphor. I could kick my dog and he would still love me, right? It's unconditional. I can't do that forever. At some point, he will either bite back or he will leave. He will run away. And if he bites back, that would even be an expression of his love because he wants me to stop so that he can, he can continue the relationship with me. And mm. in a relationship, in a loving relationship, when, when we go into that relationship, we, we are in maintenance, in, in acquisition mode, right? We do all the things. We do all the things. We're in acquisition mode. It's, it's a bit marketing. We're in marketing phase pretty much. And then we, we go into maintenance mode. Then, then we have that customer, <laughs> so to speak, right? And, yes. and then we go into maintenance mode. But maintenance mode is not enough in a relationship. Maintenance mode is not enough in a relationship. And when you stay in maintenance mode, it's a matter of time when one or the other doesn't feel that love anymore. And, and go like, I feel like I'm, that I fell out of love. And now it's interesting how love is a noun, yes, but it's also a verb because when you feel it, when you are in love, you do certain things. But on mm -hmm. the other hand, when you remember, hey, I'm falling out of love, there's something missing. When you start doing those things again, you get back into love and, and, and evoke that feeling again. So it really, you can say, I sometimes say, I believe in cause and effect, but, as, but I'm sometimes not as sure what comes first. Interesting. Interesting. Well, it's so, funny you mentioned uh, marketing, right? Because obviously you're on a show about marketing. And, and when you and I were talking, we started talking about marketing is really about creating a marketplace, which is about creating great relationships. You know, first we make people curious, then they want to be enlightened. And then when everybody's comfortable, some, you know, at some period, and it's different for everybody, then the, the parties move to commitment, you know? whether that mm -hmm. means, you, you, you know, and, and I mean, do you think that marketing, you know, tries to close the deal too quickly sometimes and that it damages the potential of a long-term relationship because they kind of go for the one night stand? Um, hundred percent. That, that can be true. I mean, just, just think the, the instant first message LinkedIn pitch that we all hate so much. Um, but then again, you can also, you can also be too slow. You can, there can be very yeah. clear signals that you can uh, close the deal and instead you buy the farm back and can, can continue not doing that. Um, so, and, and then it's interesting how you can do everything right and still a few people may be offended by that, right? You can do everything textbook wise. And it's the same sure. in, a, in a relationship. You can communicate very effectively. You can show empathy, you can show compassion, um, but it may not land in that moment. And <clears throat> I, I like how, how Stephen Covey put it. He said, um, there's effective communication, but there is no efficient communication, right? Yeah. Efficient communication is the result of, of the stars aligning. And he gives the example of his, his son wanting to break up with his girlfriend and allocating 15 minutes. Well, it took two hours in that case. He was effective, but not efficient. 
And the same happens in marketing. You can market very effectively and, um, and, and then you get the results. And in the relationship, you might have a, have a conflict and you communicate very effectively. And then Hollywood movie shows, uh, someone, a, person A yells at person B and person B says, huh, oh, you're right, <laughs> but it doesn't work that way. So you communicate very effectively and then noticing effective communication doesn't mean to get an instant result. Let it sink in, cut the person some slack. Don't belittle and, and think the other person's stupid for not getting the point. Just allow that person to have some time, communicate effectively, maybe repeat the same conversation multiple times. And when it's effective and when you're right, and being open because you might be wrong. And when it's effective, when it's good, when it's right, then it will sink in at, at some point. Like yeah, one of my mentors, Donald Miller, uh, says um, uh, that, you know, Consumers are sometimes like, it's very, it's very much like that, you know, courting part of a relationship. And he said that some, some women are, you know, uh, quality time, you know, women, right? So they want to spend quality time with you. But some women are quantity time women, right? They want to spend a lot of time with you before um, it makes sense to move to the next phase, whether that be kissing or or, or, you know, what have you. So um, I think that's kind of, uh, that's kind of interesting, you know, interesting parallel to, to, uh, to marketing, because I had a conversation this week about a company and they said, well, we don't like to do emails. You know, we don't, we don't like to send emails. And I said, well, first of all, I applaud you for at least thinking about the fact that you're, uh, you know, inflicting your, your message out on your, uh, you, you know, I mean, just having that thought, you know, shows a bit of empathy, which is great. I said, but, you know, some people, they don't, you know, if you're doing like a, a, a complicated business to business sale or something, they're not going to move to commitment on the first date with you. They're not going to, you know, move to your call to action and then and, and pay you on the first date. It's just it's just not going to happen. So they need, you know, to spend some quantity time with your message. You know, and you need to, you know, do e nurturing emails and and provide value. And, you know, I mean, you need to kind of go on dates with them, right? I mean, what do you think about that? 100%. When, when we think business, we think about the transaction, right? Because that is business. It, if I'm employed, yes, I'm giving my work and, uh, and, and I give, get money back. And if I have another business transaction, I, I give you a service or a product and get the money back. And it sounds very transactional. Relationships, on the other hand, are reciprocal. I give just out of genuine appreciation for the individual and just for who that individual is. And that individual will, if it appreciates what I gave, reciprocate in some way, shape or form. And yeah. the start of a business transaction, to get to that process of transaction, I believe I need to build the relationship and give and, and paid forward. And the same is in relationships. Yeah. And I see, I see in relationships that, that are going sour, where one partner says, I've given so much, I've given my all. Now, now he, now she needs to, needs to give. And they give away their power and stop paying forward. Because maybe, maybe they, they gave something that was, that was not so appreciated. Maybe they showered with gifts and quality time was actually the important thing, just as, as, as one example. So it's not loving harder, it's loving smarter. And really looking and, and I, it, it might need support to find that. Yeah, absolutely. I just watched the, um, the movie from the, the 80s, uh, City Slickers with Billy Crystal and uh, Daniel Stern and, and those folks. Uh, and and they, it's, there's the funniest line in there that I've forgotten about. And Billy Crystal says, uh, women, women need a reason to have sex. Men just need a place. <laughs> I've, I've, I've heard that say. I've men that just say. need a place. It, I mean, but let's talk about the difference between men and women. Because, I mean, obviously in relationships, it always comes up, right? There's, uh, you know, Dr. John Gray has written 20, 30 books on men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Uh, I'm, I'm actually friends with Dr. John Gray, brilliant guy. Um, you know, and, um, you know, there's, there's, you know, the, the difference, the, 
the differences between men and women, you know, uh, come together and you, you know, they can, they can be fantastic and they are, they could be really, you know, crazy when it comes to, um, you know, relationships. Um, how do you advise your clients, you know, in dealing with the opposite sex? Um, that is a, that is a loaded question. We could probably take a, take, take a day. Um, yeah, yeah. But I want to break it down. I want to use apologizing as an example. Because it's a very, very empower, very, very empowering sure. example. Men if you're and married, women, if, if 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 you're married, you need to learn how to apologize. Hundred <laughs> percent. And and I hope, I hope we have a little bit of time to to, to harp on that because this is this is just gold. Um, the masculine and the feminine. I'm not saying the male and the female. The masculine and the feminine needs to be apologized to in a different way. And the feminine, okay. the feminine gets her feelings hurt. Okay. And mm. she's being made sad. You made me feel sad. Right. And then the mm. man says, mm. well, I didn't hurt your feelings. I didn't stab a knife into your feelings and twist it. I would never do that. I love you. <laughs> but that doesn't help. If it's your perception that made you feel that way, but that it, it just doesn't land. So it is counterintuitive, but, but so helpful and, and shows so much empathy and compassion to say, I'm sorry that I made you feel sad. I'm sorry that I hurt you as if you did it. Although it sounds kind of intuitive, but think, think of standing in the kitchen with your, with, with your wife and she, makes a, she turns around, makes a freak movement and, and touches your, 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 your knife a little bit and she gets a little cut on her arm. Now you can't say, well, you perceive that you got hurt yourself. No, <laughs> no. There's a there's a freaking cut, and it and, exi and, it, and yeah. it exists, and you can blame her movement for it, but you were still standing there with a the knife. So, and you would profusely apologize. Of course, you would. And that take, taking that as a metaphor and saying, okay, I can apologize and I can own the other person's feelings without assuming guilt. And I want to give an example. We have chickens. We have chickens, and I was outside feeding the chickens, and I came back inside, and my wife was fuming. I had no idea what was going on. She was so angry. I said, what's up? And she said, did you not hear me shout for you? And I said, no, no I didn't. What happened? And she was, she was just pregnant with our daughter. She said, well, I had to throw up. And our son was, he was here with me, and I wanted you to take him, and you were not there. So he was there in the bathroom with me throwing up, and I wanted to spare him. I mean, it was kind of cute. He patted her, her back as a, as a two-year-old. Yeah, but you know, I, sure. Yeah. <laughs> but I apologized. I said, I'm, I'm so sorry. I would have loved to, to be there for you. And of course, there was no guilt. Uh, could I have done anything different? No, I didn't know. I was not there. But still, I apologize because if I had had the chance, I would have gone about it differently. And that's what I apologized for. And, and 10 minutes later, we were happy again and, and, and her, her stress hormones were metabolized. And that's for, yeah. for, that's for the feminine. And then when you look at the masculine, the masculine typically doesn't get, get his feelings hurt. I mean, we have feelings, we have hunger, and we can be tired, right? <laughs> Getting, no, we have sure. all the feelings too, but um, the man, the masculine typically gets disrespected or blown off. And yes. then that apology needs to be like, I'm sorry that I disrespected you. And that sounds just as counterintuitive for, 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 the, for the feminine, as the other thing for the for, for the masculine, because I'm gonna be like, I deeply respect you with every sense of my being. I would never ever disrespect you. Yeah, but the action did disrespect the masculine, and that's what he needs to hear, so that that wound can heal and close, and the tab can close, and doesn't get doesn't get presented again in in, in a couple of weeks or so. So that's an example of of how things can be very differently although counterintuitive and, and only a little bit of help and, and support can, can really help master that and make a big, big, big difference in the relationship and even, hold, and even heal old wounds that, that are years old. That's interesting. Uh, that's, that's, that's good stuff, coach. So, um, you know, you talk about executives, you know, your, your clients, the folks that you'd like to work with, the folks that you help being stuck in relationships. Um, you know, Def, you know, define what that means, you know, talk to me about how it happens and talk to me about, you know, how, how you would know. 
I think the how is um, is a bit about what we t- talked earlier about uh, about the acquisition mode and the maintenance mode. I think that is that is a, a good metaphor for the, for the how. Um, and in maintenance mode, certain needs remain unmet. And how do you know? Well, you experience nagging, maybe even the divorce, the word divorce is, is being used. And coming home doesn't recharge your batteries anymore, but it just adds stress. And, and some people then, then turn to staying at work longer because at home it's so much stress, which then again adds stress. Um, so, so those would, would be would be indicators, I would say. But, you know, so, so talking about what does it mean to be stuck in a relationship? It means like, you, you know, I mean, what, what, does it, what does it mean? What does it mean to be stuck? Stuck means that there are patterns and habits that both partners are running where they have a hard time getting out. They might try, right? They might might really try to get unstuck and think, I'm going to do more. And maybe in a, in a good conversation that they have on the, on the patio with a glass of wine, they agree on doing more, they agree on certain changes, but then in the thick of it, it all reverts back to the, to the old patterns. And um, then they think, if I'm, if I'm just stronger, if I have just more, more, more discipline in the, in the moment, then I can, then I can overcome that. And Discipline is widely, widely misunderstood as willpower, right? The more discipline you have, it's, it's a bit like you think exercising discipline or one uh, things exercising discipline is putting those, that, that bag of chips on the, on the living room table and then looking at it and not eating it. And that's discipline. Yes. Now, now you're strengthening your discipline. Now that's not discipline, that's crazy. <laughs> it's the, the, the discipline is, comes in when you walk past the chips in the supermarket and you keep your hands on the cart. It's, it's, it can be a moment where it's exercised. And it's, a make, it's about making different choices. You choose what you really want rather than what you want in the moment. But that can be hard. That's hard when the bag of chips are on the living room table. Then you have to continuously do it until the unconscious mind gets the best of you. And at some point you're like, where are the chips? Oh, they're gone. How did that happen? <laughs> you know, <laughs> sounds familiar as a, as a situation in a fight as well. Why did I say the things I said? Why did I not say the things that I should have, that I should have said? And um, sometimes it, it takes help to break those patterns to really become competent in, in, having conflicts, amicable conflicts, but also on the other hand, showing more appreciation. It's not all about handling conflicts differently. It's all about, it's also about appreciating more, um, like bringing her flowers. Even if, if you believe that bringing home flowers is stupid because, because you waste money on, on uh, plants that that, that, that wither and go to waste in a couple of days. But if she appreciates sure. it, she sees that as appreciation and it means a lot to her. Or for, for him, uh, bringing him, cooking for him, bringing him food, right? <laughs> yes. What man doesn't, doesn't enjoy that? Especially so, naked. I mean, I'm right. just going to throw it out there. I'm going to throw it out there that <laughs> naked makes that whole experience better. And uh, who doesn't the, like to have food delivered to you by someone who's naked? <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. hundred percent. And, and really looking into what, what the other person appreciates, the five love languages can be a, a beautiful way to, to look into that and get a handle on that. But then also looking outside of that and, and looking at what, what does that mean specifically and really chipping on those little things. It's not about making a huge birthday present and, and Christmas present and gifting nothing in between. If your partner enjoys yeah. gifts, the little, the little gifts in between mean so much. If it's acts of service, it's not, it's not driving on the road trip for, for 10 hours. That can be it as well, but it can be offering, offering a glass of the favorite beverage or just, just bringing it. Right. And, and yeah. looking, what are those, those little things? And those little things are so much more important than the, than the big things. And looking at hey where where can I 
Where can I double down on that? And, and asking can be a good thing. What things that I yeah. do, do you appreciate? And then the answer could be, especially if the relationship is sour already, I'm going to be like, it would be good if you, if you would. And then you listen carefully and then you just say, I hear you. And what are the things that I do do, do you appreciate? Mm. And then mm. she needs to, he needs to think a little bit more about, well, what, what does that person do? And now you divert their focus on from what he, she's not doing to what he, she is doing. That in itself is good. And then the you things know, coach, you hear, a, oh, you can yeah, double down saying, on. I was going to say, uh, you know, these relationships, they sound like a hell of a lot of work, right? Are they worth it? <laughs> is it uh, I would say 100%. I would say 100%. I mean, if you just look at, at, at statistics of people in happy relationships, how, how, how much longer they live and, and how much fitter they are and stuff. So, so science says yes. And it is just rewarding. And it, it sounds like you have to give so much to make it work. But giving and contributing is such, a, such an, an addition to our well-being. When we give as humans inherently, when we give, we feel better about ourselves. We feel better about the world. And when, we, when that giving is, is being received and we just get a thank you, when I bring flowers home, just the, just the way my wife looks at me, just that face that I'm, that I'm seeing in my inner representation right now in front of me, I'm getting goosebumps right now. I'm serious. <laughs> it's, it's just... It just makes you makes you so much happy, and all, and again, I, uh, reciprocation works. Do you know Mort Fortel? Do you know you know you know of his teachings? Mort Fortel, marriage fitness program. I don't know. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Mort is an interesting guy. He says that you have to um uh you have to you have to approach working on your relationship like you do your fitness program. You know, you need to have you you need to uh, you know kind of write down uh, you know steps to do. And he talks about the importance of date nights and the importance of uh, of getting away together away from the mm -hmm. kids, especially in those in those times when you have kids. But there's one Maybe. thing that he talks about called a touch charge, and he says that um, you know people in dysfunctional relationships they stop touching each other. And he mm -hmm. says so it's um, you need to do this thing called a touch charge, which is you just you just touch your partner in some way. And so then I started, I, I make a joke with my wife and I, uh, and I, I smack her butt. Right. And I'm like, that counts as a touch charge. 100%. Right. And she, and, and she swings around and she's like, I don't know if that's a touch charge or not. And, and, I'm, and I'm like, dude, <laughs> if Mort, if Mort were standing here, Mort would say that's a friggin' touch charge, you know, but I, I, I think it's, I, what do you think about the importance of touching though? Uh, I think, you know, Mort talks a lot about, um, he, he says that you should do it uh, intentionally three to four times a day in, in like in different ways, because uh, couples that drift apart, especially if they're um, spending a lot of time with the kids and that kind of thing, they stop touching each other. And we need that as human beings. What do you think? I, I agree. I agree. I think the it is it has a different priority for for different people. So, for example, for my my parents, and I take the the five love languages a metaphor again. My my mother is not big on touch. She couldn't care less. My father sure. is not big on gi gifts. He he doesn't care less. And we, we did, took a road trip one time, and I talked to them about the five love languages and had them guess each other's. And uh, and uh, my dad said. Well, I think I think gifts. It's so superficial. I think I think they should go off the list. And I said, "Mom, what do you think? You think touch should go off the list?" And she said, "100 percent." No, but <laughs> but in in general, I, I agree. Most people most people need touch. And I give an example. Yeah. It's funny that you that you bring that up. Yesterday evening, my wife and I were we were lying in bed. We were watching TV, and uh, we were snacking a little bit. And I was feeling like just, just lying there and watching. And I offered her a back rub. And again, that okay. face when I offered it was completely worth it. Would I have preferred to just, to just chill? Just looking at myself? Yes. Kind of, yes. But then the minute I saw her face when, when I offered and how thankful and grateful she was after, you know, yes, I, I, I gave, but it was so rewarding. Yeah. I, it, it was almost as if I gave myself a back rub. 
And that leads yeah. to other things, right? With the married couple, I mean, the the back rub is the you know doorstep to other things. It you it sure I mean? can be, it sure can yeah. be. And but that's the other thing: setting your expectations and giving that back rub to give a back rub to do something for the other person. Because if yes. back rubs mean now you want more every time, at some point you offer a back rub, and she says, "Ah, no." Because, because that back rub gets charged with your expectations. So really ah. giving her, I call it giving a true choice, offering a true choice. And sure, when you offer a choice, you probably have a preference and the other person knows that preference. But if you offer a true choice, that means that you can appreciate both alternatives and you make known that, both are, uh, um, that you're fine with, with both. And that gives the other person, shifts the likelihood to the other person, for the other person to actually want to reciprocate because she knows I can, I can say no. And if she can say no, now she's not forced anymore. And force, again, creates different hormones than, than um, the positive things. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you, so you talk about um, the impact of these personal relationships and, uh, you know, on business too, right? I mean, it does come back to business because you, you, I mean, you, you do kind of market your services to executives that are in these relationships. So what's the impact on a business if you get your uh, life at home right or better or whatever? Um, it's, it's, it's a plus in focus because you're not thinking about home anymore, but you can really focus on, 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 on the business with, let's say, a strong defense, right? You know, when I come home, I'm going to be supported. It's going to be fine. And that goes a long way. My health is going to be better, right? I'm going to be physically in, in, in better shape. I will have less sick days. And that goes, goes right into, into the business and the benef business benefits of it. Um, so those are, those are two things that, that, instantly, that instantly come to mind. Interesting. And, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, there's always kind of a perception around people that, that you work with, uh, with, with big executives, right? You know, you know, big company executives and that kind of thing. Are those folks happier or less happy than, than other people? What do you think? I think it's pretty much the same. People are happy. People are unhappy. Uh, in their professions and, and other professions. Um, and it really depends on the individual, but every person can be happy. Every person has the ability to be happy and find happiness again. Um, yeah. Very good. Very. And so, um, you know, for the audience, uh, what's the first step to creating a better relationship today? What's something actionable that people could uh, do to improve uh, whatever relationship they have, uh, unless it's a dog relationship? And like you said, that's pretty much just show up with the food and the treats, and uh, and and really just 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 show up, just just your presence there, and the dog is they're in, you know. But but what's the first step to uh, creating a better relationship with another human? I think something that is tangible and you can instantly do. You can pretty much get up from your desk and do it right now in this moment is showing them appreciation. Ideally taking the charge off their misbehaviors and showing them appreciation. But if you can't take that charge off, just show appreciation and show appreciation independent of the misbehaviors because, because you express yourself with whatever you do and show the world who you are. And with what you do, you don't show the, uh, the world who the other person is. So when you start showing appreciation, just pick up the phone and say, I love you. And if the response is, what do you want? <laughs> you know, there's, there's stuff to work on. And, and maybe it also says, shows that you need to do it a little bit more often. Stop, stop at, at Ralph's uh, pavilions or, or Whole Foods or, or whatever you have in your area and buy some flowers, bring them, bring them home or, yeah. or, some, yeah. or, or their favorite chocolate. You know, if Get I up. did the Stevie Wonder, I just called to say I love you kind of thing. My wife would go, uh, "All right, how much did you spend on the guitar, and and why did you buy another guitar?" <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it would it would instantly go there. She'd be like, "Well, all right, where is it?" 
Where is and it? Not, you know. Yeah, and and that's fine. You might get a snarky response. You might you might experience cynicism or or sarcasm as a as a response. But then don't get discouraged of it, because this is the moment we're moving forward. You're going to show more appreciation, and at some point they'll be like, first they might be like, ah, oh, he's just faking it. What does he want? But at some point, there's there's a there's a change. They recognize the shift. He's he's just doing more without wanting anything back, just doing it. And that is really something you can do, you can do instantly. Taking the charge of quote unquote misbehaviors can be a little bit more difficult, but showing more appreciation. I give you an I give you an example of, of a toxic thing that I used to do. I always like to bring flowers home, always a flowers guy. But then I would be in the store and walk by the flowers and have that impulse. Oh, I could bring her flowers. And I would be like, oh, but she did this and that yesterday that I didn't like. And if I buy flowers now, she might think that the flowers validate that what she did yesterday was all right. And that's the most toxic thing. One of the most toxic things I probably ever did because nobody makes that connection. When you bring flowers home, there might be a thing. What was that for? Right. And even if that question comes, because I love you. Very and good. it has nothing to do with any misbehaviors. So showing appreciation because you love them and they are a wonderful person and it has nothing to do with rewarding. Because if it has to, had to do with rewarding, then it would become transactional again. And you know, you even want that. And even if it's perceived like that, show that it's not and express yourself uh, respectively. Right on, Arno. Well, good. So uh, do you have anything else that you want to add here? We're, we're, we're coming to the end here, but do you have anything else you want to add for the audience? I think we've, I think we've really covered a lot and I'm really grateful for the, for the questions that, that you asked. It was a fantastic conversation. Maybe I, I end with, a, with one of the most powerful quotes that I feel in relationships and that is doing, do the right thing with compassion instead of the wrong thing out of compassion. Right, because sometimes we really we, we we do things that are not right for us to please the other person, and having compassion doesn't mean to make them happy no matter the cost. It can also mean doing the right thing for you that you know they're not going to be happy about, but doing it with compassion and love so that they understand it. Setting a boundary, for example, setting a boundary with love and and saying hey, I know we've done this and you've done this for years and it may have seemed to you that it doesn't bother me, but there's one thing that did bother me. Is it okay? Can we talk about that? And starting a conversation like that and making it unlikely that the other person says like, well, you liked that for 10 years. Why do you not lo love it anymore? Do you not love me anymore? Right? And really prefacing it and doing the right thing with compassion instead of the wrong thing out of compassion. And uh, I'm sure if everybody does that, it's what's going to be a better place. Great stuff. So, so coach Arno, how should people contact you? They want to get in touch with you. They, they want to work with you. How do they do that? Um, my, my website, www.imagine-evolution.com um, is, is a good starting point. Um, email info at arnokoch.com. Uh, my LinkedIn, my Facebook, Instagram, I'm, I'm widely available, and uh, I think there's one other Arno Koch. He lives in Ho in in, um, in Holland, I think, <laughs> in the Netherlands. Um, so yeah, it's easy to get a hold of me. But you're you're the only one in Malibu who's got a bunch of bees outside of his house. So you see, if you find the bees, that's where Coach Arno is. He's making <laughs> he's 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 out there making honey in his Malibu beach house. <laughs> <laughs> well, what have we learned, class? So we have learned that important we've learned how important relationships are in marketing and how they are uh, pretty much ignored by marketers on their way to uh, conversions and funnels and, and all these other things. Now, Coach Arnold's out there trying to help uh, busy executives live their best lives by improving those relationships. And we're always, always trying to make sure our marketing is the reasons that customers want to stay with us instead of packing their bags and moving in with their mother or moving into the Hilton. Uh, again, big thanks and thanks for being on the show, Arno. It's been it's been great having you. Thanks for thanks for being on the show. Thank you, Scott. And that's it for me, kids. We will see you the next time on May the Best Brand Win on Intertalk Media. Bye bye.